But it still says preparing on mine. Oh, now it says it. Oh yeah, live on Facebook. So hi everyone, anyone who's watching. Um, happy Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, although I guess we're kind of halfway through it already. Um, so yeah, we're doing a live today just to talk about um, personal experiences of um, mental health struggles and um, overcome. Oh no, I think we've gone quiet again. I think she's faking it so she doesn't have to do the <laughs> intro. <laughs> Also, before that, I heard a load of weird noise. Oh, no. I, I didn't really hear anything that you said, and I muted myself in case it was me. Amazing. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it sounded like a, a keyboard falling down a set of stairs. <laughs> so you didn't hear anything I said? I mean, I knew what you were going to say, so that helped, but I think if I didn't know, I don't think I would have got it. Could you lip read what I was saying? Yeah. <laughs> Um, should I just start again? I don't know if any of it... Yeah. Have you got a clapperboard? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound as good the second time, you know? It's like rehearsed now. Um, it's Mental Health Awareness Week, and we are talking today about mental health and personal experiences of um, mental health struggles and overcoming them and um yeah general experiences so we have Gemma with us today um hi Gemma hi uh, yeah um I don't know how how you want to start if if you want to start or as subtle as that was I, I've caught on to the vibes you were sending me so <laughs> um I think mental health is tricky, um, but but also some of it is linked to lots of different things, uh, the inequalities we have in the world. So some of it, some mental health stuff is almost preconditioned. So um, for women, mental health, so when we talk about depression, we think about feeling um, not good enough, things like that. Well, there are so many industries the beauty industry, the diet industry, the pornography industry, so much is built on the backs of women. Um, and the mental health stuff is a result of the sexual objectification of women and girls, which is very profitable. Um, there's also links with racism. There's lots of stuff around skin bleaching and stuff. And um, which I'm obviously not qualified to go into. Um, there's a lot of stuff around class as well. So that feeling of worthlessness when society tells you that you're worthless and you don't contribute as well. Um, class also brings into things on how you can access help. So um, obviously if you're someone who um, has enough money, you can go and get a therapist or you can get a counsellor or research a specialist. Oh, they look really good. Oh, I'll get that service then. Um, what I encounter quite a lot is I do a lot of work with young people who have been victims of child sexual abuse and child sexual exploitation and not always but the majority of the time that comes from um, working class backgrounds and poor backgrounds you don't have to give them a lot to exploit them because they already don't have a lot so from that point of view it makes it easier to do um, and also they have the worthlessness, their voice means nothing, stuff from the class as well. So then when they go to the NHS um, route for help, so they go to the GP who would refer them to a service. Um, I have personal experience of that myself. That is not very user friendly, you might say, or service user friendly um, again because there's this idea the demonization of the poor they can make do with what they get but that's also reflected in the mental health services <coughs> so my so, um myself personally i try to access um so last year i um got told by the new mental health nurse at um the doctor's surgery 
<clears throat> oh, you've been on, on antidepressants for a while. Oh, well, you can't just live like that forever. Oh, well, we'll get, we'll get yourself some therapy. We'll refer you to therapy. Um, so I rang the number. And then two weeks later, they sent me a letter with another number that I had to ring. I was told that I'd rang the wrong people and that I had to ring another person. I rang that person. They said that I'd rang the wrong service and had to ring the original number that I rang. Then they sent me another letter. Then I had, that was an appointment to ring them again. Then they said that I didn't ring in time, even though it was in the allocated time of the letter. So they referred me back to my GP. So then I had to go back, ring them again to be told again that I'd rang the wrong person, to go back to ring them, to get another letter from them to ring them, to then ring them, have an assessment on the phone, which was just like, right, tell us everything. I'm a stranger, but tell me everything in five minutes. Right, okay, you've ticked this many boxes. To wait eight months to go and get an appointment with a woman to do another assessment for her to make a face that looked like she needed a big poo, for her to send me another letter to go to see another therapist, to have another assessment, for lockdown to start, to have two appointments, and then on the second appointment for her to say, oh, well, because you're a carer, um, we don't think we can work on this stuff because you need to be at your best so you can provide those services for your child, so we can't help you. Have you tried any women's support groups? So it, it's, it's just not accessible. It's too tick boxy. And it doesn't take into consideration real life, like depression itself it's hard to keep appointments to even to get up sometimes even to get a shower sometimes it's hard to do that so for you to have to ring this number in between this hour and this hour on this day and this day like it's like they're putting barriers in in there um so the whole mental health system even when i did get um the second person I had the assessment with, I was told in that assessment that I would only get eight sessions. So there's even a time set on when you need to be over it. So the system in place is rubbish, which is the nicest way I can put it, which is why I started my CSE Rehabilitation Youth Service. Um, which a few days after opening lockdown started, but um, the whole idea behind that was because that the kids can go through the ups and downs and they can't just come to this youth club and get this help for a certain amount of sessions. They can come for a year and go away and maybe come back or whatever they need to do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not accessible to everyone and it's not responded to um, there's a lot of organisations, a lot of tokenistic stuff, the same that we do with women and equality and racism as well, is they're all talking about Mental Health Awareness Week. And yet you can guarantee if any of their workers rang up and said, oh, um, I'm not going to come in for the next couple of weeks because my depression is really bad. They tell them they were fired. It's all tokenistic nonsense. Um, just like, you know when they're talking about, oh, we have equality in our, but we'll, we'll just get the one CEO woman that we have on the board of 100 and get her to talk about it. It's the same thing, it's all tokenism. So yeah, I'm not chir chirpy about any of it. I think it's all nonsense. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it's so frustrating that that, firstly, I'm sorry that that was your experience of trying to access help. It just makes me so angry that, like that, I think that's the experience for most women. That like you're just passed from one person who can't help you to another, to another, to another, and at the end of it, there's this kind of like slight hope that you might get some help, but then actually, it doesn't ever pan out that way. Um, yeah, it's rubbish. Um, and I think, and like having the time limit, like we can offer you eight sessions or six sessions. 
it, it frames, even if you do get to see a counsellor who says that they can help you, if you know that you're going to be limited to like eight sessions, you're hardly going to be like willing to like dive deep and start processing trauma and stuff when you have this like date in mind of, well, I've got to be okay by that date, otherwise I'm going to be left with no help and no support. Well, one thing that um, makes me particularly angry is that um, you see the mental health stuff available, the so-called help available um, for victims of like, sexual crime, of domestic abuse, of stalking, and all this stuff. Um, it's usually voluntary sector women creating services and stuff as well. But then you look at all the money that goes into perpetrator rehabilitation and not you know not that that works because we don't actually talk about the actual issue is that it's men doing it so let's sort that out but um you know they, they've been shown that it actually makes them worse because they can all get together and talk about how, how they like to do this and it's like it's again it's reinforcing that idea that women don't matter as much that that idea is over and over again um I am friendly with a woman who is part of, oh, I'm not sure what you'd call it, but they're sort of like a community group where they um, are decoys of children and if any men talk to them and try and groom them and stuff like that, um, they collect the evidence and they go, um, you know, when they think they're meeting a child, they meet them and then they get arrested and stuff like that. And um, she said every single time when the evidence is there and they can't escape it they'll just go oh, oh well I need help like that's some sort of you know get out of consequences card or whatever and yet when women are victims first of all we're told that we like to be victims that's interesting and also you know that that somehow is a negative thing for women um, and not just in society, but by institutions as well. Social services is really bad for this around domestic abuse and stuff. They, they sort of say, oh, well, um, leave or we take the kids and, oh, well, you, you might get into another relationship that's like that then because you've been a victim. Like, it's like the ass doesn't talk to the elbow. The, the evidence of this stuff is there. It's been there for a long time. But because the majority of institutions are run by men, those things just aren't addressed. Sorry, I'm just muting because my dog's next to me and she's snoring really loud, but I am hanging on your every word. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Yes Matters? Um, yes Matters. So um, it was initially it was a community group. It's now a CIC. <laughs> um, so it was started in 2013. And um, the reason was because my sister was raped and murdered. And when we were in Preston Crown Court and the man was, um, I don't know um, what the technical phrase is, but he was in the dock kind of answering questions. Um, he referred to as it, that, rather than she, her. And I thought to myself, I've got so many in my life that I love a lot who do that, you know, outside the pub in the summertime, check that out or, you, you know, and they do that too. And I thought, well, why is that something they have in common? What is that? So I decided to start learning about that and that sexual objectification and um, the idea that women are here to be pretty objects, but if you're an object, you're there to serve the needs of the subject, you're replaceable and you're disposable. And that's reflected in crime statistics that we see and um, access to justice 
um, access to equality when it comes to unpaid labour, even recognition, even at the moment, 70% of the work around COVID-19 is done by women. Most of it is unpaid and yet the PPE doesn't fit us. And the reason that women um, are surviving it and men aren't, we don't know why, because our medical model is still based on white men. And um, so I started learning all about what sexual objectification was and how that is linked to gender stereotypes. In fact, it is a gender stereotype of females and how um, the male gender stereotypes around dominance, control, um, the only emotion they're allowed to show is anger, things like that, how that's very related related to crimes as well. Um, this idea that they have to be in control and dominant because otherwise they're not a man. And how you can make an eight-year-old boy cry by calling him a girl because he sees that as an insult. And what we're teaching our boys and girls, where this comes from. Because initially, mostly single mums, um, because children in the UK are more likely to have a TV in their bedrooms than they are to, to have um, a father active in their lives. Um, so we go from little boys who love their mums because they're their everything to those crime statistics and, um, you know, something has to happen. So I wanted to learn about that. I wanted to learn where that came from, what we could do about it. Um, then, um, so I started um, by thinking pornography is being sex education. One way we can prevent is by educating young people, giving them the tools to um, know what a healthy relationship is, healthy relationships with themselves and other people. That was the idea. So I wrote to, it was Ed Miliband at the time. Um, he was the labor leader. So I wrote him a ranty letter e email. Um, and didn't expect he would reply to me, and he did. His writing is fucking terrible, by the way. It's absolutely horrendous. If his people didn't email me back quoting what he said, I would have had no fucking idea <laughs> what it was. Um, so, yeah, he, he replied to me. Um, and during that time, I, were, I was friends with Laura Bates, who started the Everyday Sexism Project, um, and it was Laura, um, Leone, Liz from um, Listening to Lesbians and Shout Out in Australia, um, Megan from Child Eyes and Kim Bond, not the same one that you guys know. Um, and we all made, made Yes Matters and what we did, we... we started the petition to get um, a compulsory sex education across all public schools because it wasn't compulsory and it was kind of a postcode lottery and so we wanted it to be consent based and that was why it was because was called yes matters because you know they might not necessarily say no but it's saying the yes that matters and highlighting that um, so I went to um, Parliament for the first time when Ed invited me um, and I listened to Prime Minister's questions. Um, the first thing that struck me was that um, <laughs> they all just acted like idiots. Um, they were all shouting over each other, calling each other names. They were taking the mickey out of his speech impediment. They were, you know, they weren't listening to what he was saying at all. Um, and I was kind of like, is this really the best of us? These are the people that are elect elected to represent us, our voices in the country, really. Um, so I wasn't very impressed. Then um, I was to go and meet Ed after that. Um, I got distracted because I wanted to go and look in the, um, this sounds weird. I wanted to go and look in a cupboard, but it was a cupboard that Emily Davidson hid in. Um, so I went in there because I, wanted to um and then when I came out um they 
they were practicing for doing that weird thing, you know, where they, they bang on the door and stuff. Um, and David Cameron was there and he asked me what I was doing. Um, and I told him that I was going to go and talk to Ed Miliband and he asked what about. And I just said, well, frankly, you're quite a disappointment and not very smooth. So I don't really see why I should tell you why I'm here. Um, my friend later got that put on the tea towel for me. Um, but yeah, I went and I met Ed and he, he seemed really nice and he was um said he cared, said he had two sons that he didn't want to think that way about women and um you know he was all right and he has previously sort of said or oh, seem see me into some emails if no one's listening to you and things like that. So he was helpful. But again it was just kind of it was just like it, it's accepted the way it is so you know like that statistic it's been like oh a few women a week die from domestic violence it's been that statistic for how long and it's kind of like we've just accepted that like that that's an okay state of affairs and you know he wasn't like oh this is terrible let's do let's fix it let's that just wasn't there um he did care but there wasn't any he just didn't think that it could go anywhere I suppose yeah. <laughs> um so I thought I'll do it my bloody self then essentially um and from there we did we thought well if we have um the evidence to back up what we're doing um and we address the people profiting from it and stuff like that and then we'll figure out how we can sort out the aftermath um, so I went to Bolton Uni, um, did a couple of degrees there because I wanted to inform my practice so it was the most effective for, for whoever I was working with. Um, we did research for European Parliament um, three times. Um, we got sex education onto the curriculum and we helped to write the CSE prevention policy um, that may or may not be coming out, not really sure now. Um, but we've been about and we've done a few things. But the big stumbling block just seemed to be the sexual objectification because it, we, we just don't matter as much as men. Every time we try and talk about anything, we get, not all men, don't tell us all the same brush, you're gonna hurt our feelings, that's not very nice. And, and what you're saying there is, I don't want to hear about all those bodies piling up and all that suffering and all that anguish because you're going to hurt my feelings and I'm a man so I matter more than all those women piling up. That's essentially what they're saying. And then they'll call themselves a good guy. But, you know. Um, so we can never get past that. We can, ne we can never say water is wet without them getting upset. Um, so if we can't name the problem, we can't address it and we can't change it. And it doesn't matter how many fancy pieces of paper that I have. Every time I go into any room, any meeting, any young person, any court case, it doesn't matter what it is. I can guarantee every single time I'm going to get not all men. And when I say, well, does every man have to rape or kill or hurt a woman before it matters? Is that is that what you're saying to me? And they can never answer that. And I just think, you know, not all drivers drink and drive. We still have the campaigns. Not all cigarettes will cause cancer. We still have, do you know, it's irrelevant. And it's not just that... I mean, obviously, when women are killed and girls are killed, it's really bad. But when we have the other stuff as well, that seems to be some sort of rite of passage for girls, they're left damaged. And that damage makes it easy for the next person to treat them like shit and the next person to treat them like shit and the next person to treat them like shit. And in the case of Leeds, with their safe zone, um, the state goes from failing the women to them profiting off them. 
um, the same with strip clubs, the same with pornography, um, all of it. So we we let corporations groom women and girls. Well, yeah, well, they groom girls to say, you're only worth something if you're sexy. Then when they are sexy, they say, well, you brought it on by yourself because you're sexy. And then they hate themselves, so then the next guy can just treat them like shit. And then we'll say, well, why did you not leave? You know, it, it's just constant exploitation, whether it is the case of now, all these mothers and stuff doing all this unpaid labour all the time. Or it's, we'll take a picture of this woman and we'll airbrush this and we'll make that person feel like shit, that person feel like say person. It's always women, isn't it? There was one advert that told men maybe they could improve and they all lost their minds. So society is giving women bad mental health so that then they can pass them on to the next bloke to exploit them. Women are vulnerable, but vulnerability comes from exploitation. And all oppression is literally man-made. And until we can address and acknowledge that and take away the objectification and put the blame where it belongs, then we're never gonna be able to fix women and girls and help them rehabilitate because they're too busy blaming themselves and society is too busy exploiting that were you expecting me to be teary i mean i can be teary on like a night out and stuff but yeah but i've never known you to be cheery <laughs> that's not true when you couldn't speak to julie bindle i laughed my head off that's not being cheery that's called schadenfreude schadenfreude Bless you. <laughs> but I think you've you've put mental health in a much wider context there and why it's not enough for women to have bubble baths and go for a walk because we're connected to one another and collectively we're we're suffering. Because it's not about what we're doing or not doing, is it? It's about what is being done to us collect collectively. And yeah. And telling us to have a bubble bath and some me time and laugh when you're eating a salad and all that other shit is essentially, again, putting the responsibility to us. And whenever we acknowledge that this is happening, we're being too angry and over, over the top. So it's not about looking after ourselves. It's about us calming down, dear, so that then we don't bring trouble to them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many women would wouldn't have so as many mental health struggles or like internalized those kind of feelings if they were able to be angry and to put that out there and to go do you know what you did this to me and it wasn't okay um but we're, but when we can't can we like we just as soon as women say that that like you said they're just shut down and told yeah but not all men and all of that stuff and then that women are given labels by all these psychiatrists and, and stuff like this, but the practice isn't trauma informed. So women are given all these labels, which restrict them even further when actually the problem is that this man did this shitty thing to you and you're traumatized because of that. And that will limit their employment prospects and stuff and be on their record for life. And it's again, putting the punishment in the wrong place. But yeah. then if they don't have those labels, they don't tick the box so they don't get access to the help mm -hmm. but then the labels again it's like victim blaming isn't it the labels are saying there's something wrong with you yeah you're, you're the problem and the like the reason like mental health comes up like in america especially when a guy shoots with a gun the guy gets rejected so he shoots up a school like i get rejected well not a lot because i don't really ask a lot but when i do I go home, have a wank, have a cry, have some ice cream. I don't get a gun and shoot up a school. Yeah. But we're the over-emotional over ones that overreact. Mm -hmm. Why are you laughing, Lily? <laughs> it's just like the order of priorities there. Yeah. I think that was very, very good priorities. Was... Well, obviously, I wash my hands before I have the ice cream. <laughs> and I'm sure you wait until you get home. 
to get started as well. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm just because I'm not in a school with a gun doesn't mean I'm just in a school like that. That doesn't happen. No. <laughs> so, if we live in a sick society, how do we achieve good mental health? Um, I'd say gender is at the heart of it. Um, specifically, gender in its actual meaning of gender stereotypes. This idea that boys are supposed to be this and girls are supposed to be this, men are supposed to be this, women. So that's at the heart of it. So for boys, the male gender stereotype is very much, you know, it's weak to ask for help. The only emotion you're allowed to show is anger. Um, we see it in homophobia a lot. If a man is seen as feminine, that's why they hate it. They see him as lesser than. And we see high suicide rates in young boys and men because it's weak to ask for help. It's not manly, we don't go and do that. Don't cry like a girl, don't be a pussy, don't be a sissy. If you think about all the insults and stuff. So gender is at the heart of all the problem it's gender stereotype bullshit it, that is the issue um like I've had a um a man said to me last week men on the internet gotta love them um he said oh, it's it's a caveman instinct to be the provider and I said well no, actually no that's not true it comes from Victorian times when the children act came in and before that, before the Children Act came in, and it was a law that children had to go to school and weren't allowed to work, previous to that, man, woman and child all got the same wage. But then when that happened, the child's wage went to the man, so that then when the woman had to leave halfway through the day to look after the kid, that's how it changed. It wasn't, so it wasn't ingrained at all. The same with pink shit and blue shit. It was because some clever dude in the Victorian times thought hmm instead of dressing all the kids in the same white dress if I make some for boys and some for girls I can make twice as much money I think corporations need to take a lot of responsibility for this stuff like there was no warning on the you know red frilly lace thong in Marks and Spencer's saying oh um, don't wear this teenage girls because it might be held up in court to use to blame you for your own rape like they make money off sexual objectification, but they don't take the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. But if we address gender and we get rid of gender stereotypes and say, you know, all humans have emotions. It's not a girl thing or a boy thing. You can be a parent, you can wear a dress, you can climb trees, you can be a scientist, do, you know, do whatever. If we get rid of gender stereotypes altogether, then there wouldn't be the male entitlement, there wouldn't be the mental health, there wouldn't be the dominance in control, the need for that stuff, there wouldn't be the sexual objectification, none of that stuff would be there. And nothing I have ever heard from all the research I've done and all the people I've helped and listened to and all the stuff I've learned from other incredible women, I've never heard anything that can ever convince me that gender isn't incredibly limiting and damaging and at the heart of all this shit, because it is literally where it all starts. Mm. And until we can change that, we're not going to see another reflect, like we're not going to see improvements in society other than tokenism. But the problem is, is that gender stereotypes came from, you know, it, the profitable, and they're very linked to capitalism. So it's it's really, really tricky, especially currently. It's it's I get into a lot of trouble for wanting to get rid of gender stereotypes. I get accused of um, wanting to create trans children and wanting to kill them. I'm not really sure why I get accused of both. It's a bit weird. Um, but I will always tell a boy, don't worry, you're allowed to cry, nothing will fall off. In fact, that is literally one of the things when we do um, workshops with boys, I get them to do chants. And one of them is if I cry, my willy won't fall off. If I wear pink, my willy won't fall off. Glitter will not kill me. So it, you know, it's... I love that. 
<laughs> the lit it's literally at the heart of everything. Yeah. It's at the heart of suicides for boys. It's at the heart of, you know, lack of equal parental responsibility. It's it's there in stalking, domestic abuse, high suicide rates, in murder, in sexual crimes, in paedophilia. It's there in economic stuff. It's there in racism and homophobia. It's there in everything. So until we can address gender stereotypes, it's n nothing's going to change. And at the moment, reinforcing gender stereotypes is being linked to sort of like the um, transgender rights. So it's become even more complicated. So I'm not sure that that's really going to change. It's really hard at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think you're right in saying that corporations have have a lot to answer for when you go and you look at baby clothes for like beings that have just been born and boys clothes are saying I'm strong I'm awesome I can do anything and girls clothes that just say I'm pretty and future bride and like they're babies <laughs> yeah I've seen um heels for baby girls oh wow um but equally when when I will say like if I say on Facebook there's a pole dancing party for little girls I'll be the one commenting going why are you doing the grooming for the paedophiles what's wrong with you because you know I had to sugarcoat things I'm charming like that and I get I'm the one that gets oh I'm being approved and it's I don't understand how you are not connecting A to B here and empowering for a child to to practice what yeah pole dancing <laughs> yeah. yeah and like copying like the pussycat dolls and yeah. and all that like and they do they copy because then they see all the tears and they see everything that's how you're supposed to be mm -hmm. and all the men that say not all men when they have a teenage daughter change their mind pretty fucking sharpish mm -hmm. so they do know what they're doing and they protect each other, um, even though it harms them too. Yeah. But I'm just a man-hating feminist, so don't listen to me. You've got some videos on your channel. Um, do you want to speak about them? Because I can't remember what any of them are about, except you've got one for gender stereotypes for primary school age children. And I watched with my daughter and now she looks out for them everywhere. In fact, I think she's too good at spotting them and she sees them where I don't think that they are. Can I just she's she's hyper vigilant to them. But um, I've been trying to explain that stuff to her for a while, but it was honestly your video that really got through to it. And now she sees it in all the books, in all the TV shows, in all the adverts, um, and then just in general life as well. So I can't recommend those videos enough. And I know you're going to say something about how you haven't had time to do more and you're going to feel bad. Let's just focus on how great the ones that you have done are. I wanted to read this comment. Abby said that it's a really interesting topic and that you are such a great, knowledgeable speaker, Gemma. That is so true. Thank you. Everything you've been saying, I'm just like, mind blown. You're making so much sense. You're going to go and watch the videos for primary school age children, aren't you, Amy? Uh, I already did. <laughs> doing your homework you're a good yeah. journalist suddenly the i thought i was the stalker now i've become <laughs> <laughs> tables have turned you're the famous one now i think it was the one about consent um that i watched well i remember um when i went to bolton uni um I had to spend four months convincing them to play the consent is like a cup of tea video one time in like the main thing. Have you oh not seen my that? God. It's, and even then they, they had a hissy fit. I, I didn't, um, I, what, what can I say? I caused ripples at uni. 
shall we say. The, the SU imagine. manager, he sweated a lot whenever he saw me. It was... The consent, the cup of tea thing is so, it's so unoffensive and it's so, like yeah, anybody can watch that and get it. It's not, it yeah. doesn't point fingers. It just says this is what consent is. You would think. Yeah, um, I, I addressed a few things at uni. Um, there, there was a thing, I think it was just after there was a London terror attack um there was i think they crashed a car or something i can't remember exactly what it was and suddenly there was lots of posters everywhere saying is religion dangerous and um i went into the su thing as i did often um and i said why why are these posters up everywhere we have so many international students that you know in Bolton where UKIP have the most voters are already gonna feel really scared and I know like um half of my class at the time they were having their lunch and their breaks in the toilet because they didn't want any trouble and I said and you're putting these posters up and he said it's free speech I'm like is it is it okay then all right so then I went over to um, the computers and I made the poster exactly the same, same font and everything. And underneath each poster was a new poster that said, are men dangerous with the statistics that over 90, 95% of crime in every country, in every century ever is committed by men. And why don't we ask questions? And it's failing our sons to not ask why this happens. He came into my next lesson to get me out to say that the posters were gone. And it, it's the thing is, it's all, all I see what I do is, is that I say something. Because if I don't say anything, then my silence is saying that it's okay, that that's acceptable. So all I try and do in life is to say that it's not okay. Even if it's not about me, even if it's not directed at me, even if I don't like the person, if something's not okay, I will say that's not okay. Even if I can't, I don't have the power to do anything, I'll just make the person doing it uncomfortable, as uncomfortable as possible. Um, the videos, um, they were sort of to try and have some sort of PSAT lessons. Um, during lockdown um, and I just sort of looked at the sessions that we did and tried to do kind of a summary of them sort of thing and also um, kids listen to people on the internet that aren't their parents it's like magic as long as you're not their mum they will listen to you so um, I just thought I'd do that um, did some stuff on TikTok as well and I now have a few young people messaging me for support and stuff, which is great. Um, very new to the whole YouTube video thing, as you can probably tell. But um, essentially, I just wanted to get important messages across. That, that was it. Stuff that I think that I want kids to know, because I think essentially, if we teach young people about gender stereotypes, and about representation then that's giving them the tools like the critical analysis tools to so that then they can do it for themselves so they can see the bullshit so that then it affects them less and so that then they can say to the mates who were laughing because oh I took no, this girl sent me this picture and they're all laughing or my girlfriend sent me this I promised I wouldn't show you but this or mm -hmm. doing a racist joke or, or look at him his shoes are shit because he's too poor whatever it is if they're already aware of that stuff and you've already given them them tools and those messages and you've planted those seeds then that will go out because they can go to the mate and say that's not okay or what you know whatever it is um because essentially if we think about it adults the world we've built isn't great and um i'm bisexual 60 40 but 
Um, when I watch programmes, I don't like boobs in it for no reason. I've got nothing against boobs. Boobs are great. But I don't have to see them and see like sexualized stuff constantly. It's all the time. So to think that your kids are innocent and not affected by this is just, it's just unrealistic. The average age of exposure to pornography in the UK is between ages eight and 11. And the, the sexual crimes, including rape in primary schools has gone up a lot. It's unrealistic to think that your kids aren't affected by this. And I'm sorry, but if you're a dad and you, you've got all this, this porn and stuff like that, you're not a good parent. You're not. And for the guys pointing over there going, oh, look at those guys over there with their teen brides, the disgusting pedos, and then Googling hot stepdaughter on new porn. You're no different, mate. You just, you're a hypocrite. You are absolutely no different. So your kids are going to be affected by this attitude. They're going to be affected when they read in the newspaper when we've got a female prime minister, let's talk about a kitten heels and not about what she's saying. When we're talking about, you know, singers and we've got Ed Sheeran who comes out in a scruffy jumper and some jeans, but he's got an amazing voice and he's a genius. But, oh, let's all look at Adele's weight loss. You know, they're getting these messages even, you know, the mums as well, although I, I understand where it comes from. We're all constantly groomed into this thing that you have to be like in this box or you're wrong. But if you're a mum who's on Weight Watchers and constantly going on about a weight and you've got little girls, you can't expect them not to be affected by that message. So you need to give them this information because corporations are going to give it to them, whether that's in the pornography industry, the diet industry, the beauty industry, fashion industry, game industry, YouTube, whatever. If you don't give them these tools and you don't talk to them about this stuff, then when something happens, they're not going to feel like they can come and talk to you about it. They're not going to be armed. They're not going to be ready to deal with it. So you're not keeping them innocent you're just sending them out without any armour on. Mm -hmm. That's what's actually happening. Mm. And bad lessons, when, when bad things happen, a lot of the time when bad stuff happens, women feel like, oh, this is terrible. Oh, I can't tell them this. But actually when something bad happens, if there's a, a breakdown in relationship, for example, or um, one woman that I know has had a domestic abuse situation going on and she was so oh well don't bad mouth the dad don't bad mouth the dad and I said well no what you should do is sit your child down and say well these things happened <coughs> controlling or this or this or this and that's not acceptable in a relationship when you're with someone you should respect yourself and each other. You should do this, you should do this, you should do this. If you see this red flag, this red flag, this red flag, then that's not acceptable. So that's why we're not together anymore. I hope your dad can work on himself and find someone that cares for him and or whatever, be nice about that, fine. But be honest with your children about what the problem is and why things had to change. Because then you're teaching them what they should expect of themselves and others in a relationship in the future. But you're also teaching them that life is shit sometimes. We all fuck up, but what matters is how we respond to it. We learn from it. We don't blame someone else. Here's what we've learned. Yeah, this happened, so now we're going to do this. So then when they make a mistake in life and fuck up, they're not going to be so down on themselves because you've taught them. that That's okay, because that happens sometimes. So... We need to stop treating our kids like they're made out of like tissue paper because they're not. And the world isn't that delicate because we've not made a very good one. So we need to prepare them so that then their mental health is better. And so their well-being is better. And so they're more safe. Oh, no, Poppy wants a tummy rub, for God's sake. I think you've got another one, Max. You're very wise, Gemma. Yeah, totally. So we've been on for about an hour and it's been awesome. 
but do we or does anybody watching i don't i don't actually know how this works on facebook because we're doing zoom on like zoom on facebook live for the first time and i don't know how it works so you can still see things that people have posted i'm just looking on my phone at the comments. okay have we have we between us got any questions for Gemma? Mm. It okay. can't be related to The Sims, although she is a sim expert. We can talk about that later. I forgot to tell you that about Gemma. <laughs> Amazing. I like long walks on the beat. I'm an Aries. <laughs> but, what, but what's your favourite colour? My favourite colour is TARDIS blue. Mm. That's it's very specific. <laughs> It's dark and bright at the same time, so I like it. Ooh, I'm bigger on the inside, just like all of us. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I can't see any comments, any more comments. Well, I, for one, would love to have you on again. So if any questions come up, I would love the opportunity to throw them at you and see what comes out. Okay. Anyone else, anyone here have any questions? I don't have any questions, but um, I just wanted to say that you're amazing and the way that you explain things is just brilliant. Like, it just makes so much sense the way that you, the way that you're saying it. And I think it's just that kind of complete honesty of, of how you see it. Um, and that's, you're not like beating about the bush kind of thing. It's just that's it that's how you see it and that's how it is and it's just really refreshing to hear that so thank you for sharing all of that yeah I don't sugarcoat it not all people agree that it's it's something they enjoy but yeah it's definitely a good thing like without a doubt and I would say those that say that they don't agree it's because what you're saying affects them and makes them think about their own behavior and who they are and their own beliefs so Mm. Yeah, and that's a good thing. Absolutely. Men on the internet are defensive, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it gives you some good games of bingo, right? Yes, I have my not all men bingo in the kitchen. Love it. I need to get um need to get eight to be able to have some Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um how, how many are you on today? Um, I've not been very active online today, so I've only had about six. <laughs> so I have like, not all men, why do you hate men, fucking dyke, cunt, you just need a good shagging. Um, oh, I can't remember the other one. Are there any men well, right now? You want to help Gemma get her benefit? <laughs> in the comments <laughs> the night's still young Gemma so maybe we should sign off but maybe we should just keep talking because I know Amy's going to have some questions about Sims <laughs> I don't know if I have questions about Sims you, you don't you, Gemma needs to tell you her Sims game and then you'll have questions oh, okay I'm looking forward to that all right, right so we'll... Ellie's the one that needs all the Sims knowledge like hey, I'll, I'll have you know I've got two Sims on the go now Two households. Yeah. yeah. I I have no idea how many I have. <laughs> I've just made last night I made all the characters out of little women. I have no idea <laughs> how you can only have two. I think mean, that's it. My hands are full with two. But anyway, let's sign off. And maybe we'll do another live another day about the sims specifically because it's something that's important to all all of us here i mean all of us i can see on the screen right now i don't know how many for my mental are. health it is yeah i need to check on my triplets actually i've i've uh, not checked in on them <laughs> i'm glad they don't carry on living when you're not playing the game that would make it a lot oh, more difficult do they? <laughs> 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 all right <laughs> somebody press the button Bye, Facebook. Bye, Facebook. Bye. Bye. Bye.